I'm here today to talk to you about the state of public safety in Chicago. I know that people are scared and emotions are on public safety, and specifically gun violence, including carjackings, are running high. And it is threatening not only our residents, but our police officers as well. Already this year, 69 police officers have been shot at or shot alone, the most in almost a decade. And this includes Ella French, who, as we all know, paid the ultimate price when she was killed in the line of duty. To address this problem of the volume of illegal guns, the Chicago Police Department has reinvigorated dedicated gun teams and continues to lean into our partnership with the ATF and other federal, state, and county law enforcement and federal prosecutors. CPD are seizing guns, systematically debriefing arrestees to find the source of the guns, running traces, signing up confidential informants, and doing everything possible to be proactive in this fight. This work is important and another vital tool in keeping our streets safe from illegal guns. But more can and must be done. That requires additional resources and help from our federal partners. You have heard me and Superintendent Brown talk about the issue of the number of violent, dangerous people out on electronic monitoring. I know no one believes that our communities are safer if murderers, attempted murderers, rapists, carjackers are placed on electronic monitoring and EM uh, or EM and are essentially free to go about their business after they are charged. Of course they are entitled to a presumption of innocence and their day in court. Those rights are sacrosanct under our Constitution. I'm also not saying that nonviolent offenders or poor people should be held in custody pre-trial. I fundamentally do not believe that the Cook County Jail should be a debtor's prison. But if you are charged with killing someone, trying to kill someone, taking a vehicle at gunpoint, rape, or violence against someone in your home or theirs, for those people, I absolutely believe that they should be locked up pending trial because they are demonstrated, quote unquote, real and present threat to the physical safety of people and community as defined under Illinois state law. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, Cook County criminal judges have let almost 2,300 offenders with these charges back onto our streets, in our neighborhoods, on our blocks. It simply defies common sense. It's not safe. And this practice must be stopped immediately. We are in a crisis, and state law explicitly requires judges to consider community safety in making individualized bond decisions. Electronic monitoring was supposed to be paired with community supervision, and primarily for nonviolent offenders. In Cook County, there's virtually no supervision, nor any mandated community interventions. The Cook County electronic monitoring system is fundamentally broken in a way that is making our city unsafe. The county courts need to get the balance back and reserve electronic monitoring for only nonviolent offenders. But until that time happens, I am calling for an immediate moratorium on electronic monitoring for offenders where the lead charge is murder, attempted murder, aggravated gun possession, felons in possession, sex crimes, illegal gun possession, vehicular hijacking, carjacking, kidnapping, or, or attempted kidnapping, or other kinds of violence. I will be sending a formal request to the Chief Judge, Tim Evans, the Criminal Court Presiding Judge, and Presiding Judge responsible for pretrial release, demanding that this moratorium be put into place. Now let's talk about our fight against gangs. We also need to continue striking consistently hard blows against gangs in our city. Not only are gangs a major source of violence in our neighborhoods, they prey upon our most vulnerable residents. I will press the City Council to debate and then pass the Victims Justice Ordinance. 
Gangs are violent and dangerous and ruthless. They do not care who they hurt in their quest for money and territory. And we need not just seize their cash, but their assets as well. We need to take away the profit motive by depriving them of the blood money, along with locking them up. This will not be rightfully, this will not be the rightfully discredited forfeiture policy and strategy of the 1990s. It's quite different. We will go after the leaders of the gangs. The shot callers are the ones who overwhelmingly profit from the carnage that's happening in our streets. We will go into court before a judge with a civil lawsuit where we will have the burden of proving that particular assets, cars, properties, businesses, are in fact the proceeds of gang activity. The defendants will be represented and, in, and like in any civil case, a judge will determine if we have proved our case. And when we do, we will dedicate a portion of the proceeds to support victims, witnesses, and survivors in Chicago. I have returned a little bit worse for wear, but I'm back and I'm very, very excited to join you again tonight for this Tuesday night edition of Chicago Corner. That video of Mayor Lightfoot, unfortunately, was buffering uh, from my desktop here. So although we got some of the audio, uh, I believe her image froze up a little bit, but I think uh, hopefully many of you uh, saw her press conference when it aired yesterday or saw one of the rebroadcasts. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight are several issues that she brought up in her press conference. One was the uh, her, her decision to request more federal intervention here in Chicago, asset forfeiture uh, for gang leaders, and uh, the uh, rescinding the electronic monitoring program for violent offenders uh, who are not going into jail, but they are um, uh, basically under house arrest. Now, I had another video I wanted to share with you really quickly. I'm, I'm going to see if it actually shows here when she was praising the police department here in Chicago, uh, what she, what she, I just find it very, very amazing that as much as she praises the Chicago department and the Chicago police department and shovels money into their coffers, this is essentially uh, who's heading the Chicago police department and his attitude towards service here. Let's see if we can get this. Pat Young. Here we go. $2.9 million this city council just gave to a person who basically outed herself. There was a raid with a wrong address. It was an honest mistake. That video was never supposed to see the light of day, not only because the mayor uh, didn't want the embarrassment and was trying to hide it, kind of like her predecessor did, but the reality is, the court said not to. Her lawyer was the one who pushed to have that video released so then he could turn around and sue the city, which is what they did. And now we have Alderman giving $2.9 million to somebody who was not beaten, not shot, not anything by the police department except maybe embarrassed. And I'm not discounting the, the embarrassment level of this. Uh, about not being clothed, but $2.9 million of taxpayers' money being given willingly by the majority of the aldermen in city council. It's unreal what this city has turned into, but that's where we're at. That's why things need to change. That's why there needs to be a super PAC fund to go after these aldermen who just don't get it. No matter how many times it's explained to them, they just don't get it. They have their own agenda, and shame on them. But we'll deal with that at a later date going forward. Wow. That's the head of the union whose praises uh, Mayor Lightfoot was singing uh, as far as uh, police efforts <clears throat> to stop violence on the streets, um, claiming that the root cause is in the neighborhoods, not realizing that the root causes are the fact that money's not being invested in these neighborhoods. There's no effort by the city to change lives in these neighborhoods across the city. And, you know, uh, I, I want to proudly say that I'm, I actually let, left a comment on Cotton Zara's YouTube channel where that video came from that said, if you assholes would do your job, maybe there'd be less lawsuits. But I digress. I want to introduce a very special guest who's agreed to join us tonight. I was actually going to share some of his uh, quotes from Twitter regarding the situation with the mayor's press conference last night. Uh, returning friend of the show, Mr. 
Jamal Green. Jamal, thank you for joining us tonight. Always good to be on the Chicago corner. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this was, uh, I, I caught the press conference after it happened. It was brought to my attention. And it was, it was interesting because I was looking for links to the actual press conference last night. And I guess her press conference was more towards the end of the day. Yeah. And press kind of covered it overnight, so there was more coverage about it today. But I did catch some of your comments on Twitter, and immediately I reached out hoping you could join us tonight, which you could. Um, there were a few quotes there that I thought were really, really kind of sized up uh, some of my thoughts also, if I could share them. You said uh, uh, that keeping people in, in regards to the, um, in regards to the uh, electronic monitoring, Yep. Keeping people in jail who can afford bond or meet the requirements of pretrial services is an injustice to our community. The reality is, is that the real violent offenders aren't being caught. Take responsibility and improve the clearance rate, not find a publicity stunt. Uh, also, Mayor Lightfoot says she wants the county to put a moratorium on electronic monitoring for violent offenders, and she wants to sue the gangs for assets. Let me be the first to tell you this is bullshit and screams that she has no plan. And this is one of the things that struck me too, Jay Mall, is that she hasn't had a plan. And suddenly, you know, the press conference yesterday was, let's get the feds in here. Let's start suing people. Um, you went on to also say data has consistently shown that the county's electronic monitoring plan does not contribute to a large amount of violence. Judges make the best decision based off of the state's attorney's briefing of the case. This would result in many innocent people sitting in jail again. So there really is a responsibility on the state's attorneys to make their cases so that the electronic monitoring program is not uh, utilized with more violent offenders. 100%. 100%. I think that the state attorneys do their job uh, when it comes to talking about the um, the cases that are brought before the judges. Then, then they also have to consider their background. They also have to consider, um, uh, are they potential flight risks? There's many things that goes into... Um, what makes the judges uh, decide uh, uh, on pretrial services. Uh, and at the end of the day, I don't think that there should be a moratorium on electronic monitoring, uh, knowing there'll be so many folks who, um, you know, will be sitting in jail pending trial based off of the police officers and the state's attorney's word. And, and the reality is, is that the state's attorney gets the, the police report from the police department and, um, you know, they get a lot of cases wrong. We have seen that police officers have gotten things wrong. They think they've solved cases and got the wrong person. Uh, and they don't need uh, a lot of evidence, right, to file charges against people. So when they file charges, um, the state's attorney say, well, you know, I guess you have some sliver of probable cause. Then that person has to then defend themselves and say, uh, uh, and, and prove and, and use evidence to show that they were not that person. But for them to sit in jail all the way until that uh, they're able to prove themselves, to prove their innocence in court, um, I think is, um, you know, out just an injustice and um, really hurts our communities. If there are cases where there are violent offenders, but there are situations where, you know, say there's a video of somebody shooting someone, when they tell that to the judge, uh, and the judge sees that video because the judge will look at the video uh, for bond purposes and say, OK, well, you know, it looks like there's some sort of evidence that shows that this person is violent, um, even though they're supposed to really presume innocent. Um, you know, then at that point, they will uh, move forward uh, a no bond or a certain bond to keep that offender away. Now, she made a point during her press conference of discriminating between violent offenders and nonviolent offenders and emphasizing she's not she's not in favor of this for the nonviolent offenders. But as you just said a moment ago, um, the police either get it wrong or they yeah. intentionally get it wrong. So you will have a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, those charged who can't make their bail that are not a violent threat to the rest of the public uh, sitting there when uh, the, the, the electronic monitoring program, it seems is not being instituted or not being, um, oh, what's the word, uh, um, invoked the right way. I do want to be fair, though, when we talk about the public's concern about the electronic monitoring program, I want to share a quick little report from uh, yeah. ABC News WLS here in Chicago. 
-hmm. that speaks to the fact that there are a lot of nonviolent offenders. And now this report is also, I think, pretty objective and and fairly balanced as far as talking about what we just spoke about with the nonviolent offenders, as well as the concern for those that are slipping through the cracks. Let me play the video real quick. Alan, there are more than 3,000 people charged with crimes right now wearing ankle bracelets in Cook County so authorities can keep track of them. A more than 30% spike in electronic monitoring here the last year and a half, with the wait time for trial also increasing. Many on monitors for a year or more. All of it tonight, the target of a biting new report. Ultimately, electronic monitoring is often billed as an alternative to incarceration And what we've learned is that it's really an alternative form of incarceration that's causing people to be locked in their homes, often 24-7. Who's locked up here at Cook County Jail awaiting trial and who is released on a GPS-linked electronic monitor such as this was the focus of an investigation by the Chicago Appleseed Center for Fair Courts, a nonpartisan research organization that advocates for an equitable and accessible legal system. Their data reviewed by the I-Team reveals that almost three quarters of those on electronic monitoring are black and that eight of every 10 people released to home confinement in Cook County also had to pay a cash bond to get out of jail. Which is just a double punishment that isn't helping anyone. We also found that most people who are on electronic monitoring are extremely successful. Sheriff Tom Dart administers the nation's largest pretrial electronic monitoring system. A DART spokesman tonight tells the I-Team that judges place defendants on the bracelet and that it's not a long-term fix for rising violence. As the I-Team has reported and DART's office notes, 75% of those on electronic monitoring face violent crime charges. Dozens are accused of murder and ordered released anyway. We should think about what it looks like to pull back on a program that's causing so much harm in our communities Yesterday and today, we asked Chief Cook County Judge Tim Evans for his response to the critical evaluation of electronic home monitoring. On both days, a spokesperson for Judge Evans said that they were still reviewing the 18-page report. Now, that report came from September, that, that news yeah. report. And I believe that I noticed that in your uh, Twitter feed, you had, meant, you had shared something uh, regarding, I think, Mayor Lightfoot reaching out to uh, Tim Evans also. Um, what, what do you know about, or was that you saying that you wanted yeah, to I reached out, I reached out to chief judge Evans. Okay. Um, he is a friend of mine's, um, and you know, I'm pushing back on, um, you know, let me just say there are, of course, there are situational cases, uh, in regards to electronic monitoring program, but, you know, just like she said, there are also many cases where the judges are, you know, double punishing people. I was one of those people. All right. Who, yeah, I, I forgot to mention in your intro, you're public enemy number one with Mayor Lightfoot. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> but, a couple months ago. <laughs> but but no, I, I when I was arrested years ago at a protest in 2016, okay. um, I was given a three hundred fifty thousand dollar bond. I was given twenty four hour home confinement. I was given a no social media and a gag order. Okay, so I had Judge Tiempis who went over and beyond to try to. To, to hurt me because she just really didn't like me and like the fact that we were protesting um, for, um, you know, protesting against police brutality. So <clears throat> the judges have the discretion. And, um, uh, and at the end of the day here, you know, what we need to talk about is we need to talk about how do we start to pour money into prevention uh, and what prevention really looks like. We can't, you know, Lori Lightfoot always talks about uh, everything that happens after a crime. OK, we talk about uh, jail. We talk about electronic monitoring. We talk about police, everything after the fact. But she never talks about how do we have create a safer city with safer communities where we need less police, where we need less state's attorneys, where we need less electronic monitoring, because we have more productive citizens who are doing the right thing that has access to opportunities and access to capital and access to live the, the, uh, uh, the, the live a life of, of happiness and, and, and a good quality of life throughout these neighborhoods. I mean, 
this is our opportunity right now to start changing the state of these neighborhoods and stop pointing the finger. Lori Lightfoot is so good at pointing the finger. Her whole press conference, she blame, 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 yep. blame, blame, blame. The federal government needs to do this with guns. The uh, um, um, the 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 Cook County needs to stop electronic monitoring. Judges need to stop letting folks out. This blame, blame, blame. But what can you do in your power as the mayor of a twenty billion dollar budget of with park districts and transportation and public schools and thousands, 40,000 city work. What can you do in your power with all that you have as the mayor who can sign executive orders, who can tell city council to pass ordinances, and you have so much power over departments, you are telling me that you have no role in changing the quality of life for what's going on in these neighborhoods? That is showing that you don't have a plan and to get reelected, you must find a way to blame everyone else. We can't have a mayor like that. We need a mayor that's going to take responsibility for their role in their administration. And what is their administration going to do uh, uh, to improve the quality of life of our residents? And we've talked about this in the past also. Her, her quote unquote plans are reactionary. Yeah. They're not preventative. They're never preventative. Exactly. And I think if this press conference really proved anything, it's that she's in over her head that she's got to start playing the blame game here because people are fed up. Uh, they want action and they're not getting it. When yep. she talks about what, she just started letting um, retail merchants know that the solution to the problem, uh, because the police, this great police department we have isn't able to uh, stem crime uh, down on the magnificent mile is to start yeah. buzzing people into the stores. Yeah. Or hire and, your and, own private security. Now, we also saw so, in Bucktown, the, the, the Neighborhood Association is hiring private security, which I think on its own is like so liability fraught uh, for with with the potential for disaster because... I'm, I'm, man, I'm really hurting for our businesses right now, Jerry. I'm, yeah. I'll be honest with you. Our businesses are in a, between a rock and a hard place. Businesses, especially our small ones, are those folks who um, have high turnover rates and folks who don't want to come to work. You have really business owners who are trying to make ends meet, trying to figure out how they can see a profit margin, right? Doing everything that they can. And <clears throat> you have a mayor who has a, so much control as um, the, the top official that she's not doing everything that she can to improve the quality of life, to protect businesses. And then on top of that, she wants to penalize businesses who are not doing what she tells them to do. Right. So she's not protecting them. She's not helping them. She's not giving them any type of incentives. And then we have COVID. And now as of January 3rd, you know, businesses are going to have to make sure people have masks on their face, make sure people have vaccination cards. They're going to have to do They're, they're now the vaccine police. And if they don't do it, they're going to get fined two to ten thousand dollars a piece. When they're already struggling, they're already barely uh, 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 getting through. They already are in a situation where folks are, are going to be resistant to this and not coming to their business, uh, um, resulting in less sales. And so I really I'm really, um, you know, uh, at loss for words right now for what our businesses are going through as an entrepreneur. And, and I've owned many businesses over 12 years. Um, you know, uh, Lori Lightfoot just really doesn't understand. Uh, what it means to to try to keep businesses afloat. And, and I'm just really saddened to see our businesses continue to fall and continue to leave. Well, within the past 24 hours, she's really been on the war path. And uh, another comment you made on Twitter, which I thought was very, very uh, salient. Lightfoot is mandating that on January 3rd, you can't enter into bars, restaurants, gyms without a vaccination card or negative test. The mandate bothers me because it'll only hurt small businesses because people will resist. Plus, vaccinated people are still carriers and the market for cards will surge. So very, very true. Yeah. Um, I mean, businesses are going to suffer. People are going to get the I'm fake sorry. cards. No, please continue. I'm sorry. I just wanted to. Uh, no, they're they're going to suffer. I had a business owner today telling you today. Just hours ago, tell me, Jay Ma, I can barely make people put their mask on. I got to fight with people to put their mask on when they come in here. Yeah. And the city is going to find me if we're not spending every minute trying to make sure that people have vaccine cards and masks on everything. I mean, they're going to give us two, two to $10,000 fines. They're going to shut us down. 
We're, we, we can barely hire good workers who are ready to work because folks, you know, especially in a retail industry, in a restaurant industry, you, you, you already know that there are low wages and, and everything that happened over the past year. We're in a situation where it's hard to get folks back into the, to the retail workforce. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're having a hard time. So now they have another burden on them. Now that people, less people are coming into your establishment because of COVID, right? Right. You must make sure that you are the vaccine police. You must make sure that people have a mask on. Where's the, where's the help for our businesses? Where's the programs? Where are we, where are we putting together a fund to support these business owners who are going to go through a hard time for the next, for the first quarter of the next year? And, and, and that's where our attention should be trying to push the administration to support these businesses because they're taking it rough and the black businesses are going to take it the worst because the reality is folks in the inner cities where the lowest, where we have the, the largest number of people who are resistant to the vaccine because they don't feel like, you know, the government cares about their health because they're living in poverty. They're, they're living in um, uh, polluted areas. They have lead in their water. They dodging bullets. You know, so the vaccine is really the last thing on their list. They're pushing a vaccine, but to them, you know, they feel like, well, y'all never really cared about us ever before. So why should we listen to you now? It's that, that trust is so broken with the government. And uh, at the end of the day, where, where those numbers are, are, are low and we're, we're trying to force it on them, that's where our small businesses are. And so our small businesses are then trying to, um, you know, our small business are then trying to try to have sympathy for these folks who come in who are really resistant to it, right? And so if they're if they're not the police and and putting their foot on them, they're going to get fined by the city. Yeah. So you know these small businesses are are really going to be in 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 a, in a tough position come January third, uh, and mandates and and forcing folks is just not it's just not the best way here, uh, not in these communities. It just doesn't work in these communities. We got to have better ways to build trust within the people and the government so that when we do say these are, this is the guidance that you should take, they'll take it. And, you know, the reactionary response there is a revenue generator to find businesses too. It's yeah, all, it always it ends up getting tied to like the city taking more money from people. It's all Let's, money. Let's okay. let's take a step back because we, we obviously when we're talking about Mayor Lightfoot uh, with the mandates or trying to push through a mandate with uh, taking a, or, or pulling back the electronic monitoring, we shifted into businesses and 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 uh, COVID now reemerging with the businesses. We didn't yep. get a chance to uh, talk about her her proposal to start suing gang members. Yeah, uh, like asset forfeiture, which we've we've seen work so well in the past. <laughs> um, where they, you know, I, I think the police department already has a program in place where they've been seizing uh, assets. From, they control the budget. They control the budget. The money go look on top of the money that the city is pouring into the police budget. They've got all the money that comes from the for the, the uh, and no right. one oversees it. And no one oversees it. Nobody knows where the money is going. They get no, the you know, how they much wanna, is there. It's insane. Yeah, it's insane. They make you know, upwards of eight, nine, ten million dollars a year. And they get to do whatever they want to do with the money. They have one person in the department who signs off on the checks. So they say, oh, well, we usually put it into technology or put it in this and that. You know, there's no reason why we should be giving CPD two billion dollars a year plus hundreds of millions in overtime. A hundred million. We've, we are at 67 million in police misconduct this year. So a hundred million a yeah, year in police right. misconduct. And we're allowing them to control when they take people cars and sell them and their assets and they get to control where they want to spend the money. That makes no sense. We should have some type of oversight and some control over that money, especially because we already given them two point four billion of our uh, 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 dollars uh, each year. So Lori Lightfoot's idea is insane. Let me let me just say this. Um, reason being is it shows how much he doesn't understand the community. Our gang leaders are in jail, okay? We're not in a situation where we have these large gangs that build and everybody's following the leader and they have all these assets that we can sue. I mean, we're not in that situation uh, uh, right now. 
We're in a situation where we have young people coming from certain conditions, creating clicks on every block, every single block. They're creating different clicks. We have thousands of gangs in the black communities, brown communities right now, thousands. And so at the end of the day, when you have a situation like that, you're not there. They're, they're, the, the market is saturated. There's no situation where the, you, they're getting um, drug rich anymore, where they're selling a bunch of weed. I mean, weed is legal. OK, so every block has 10 different people selling selling weed. See, Lori Lightfoot don't understand this because she don't understand the streets. And so the reality of the situation is, is an idea like that. It's a waste of our time and a waste of our taxpayer dollars. And you want to lodge $10,000 judgments and sue anybody you want to sue with no oversight. I mean, it's just insane. I, I think the other concern there is it's rife for abuse. When you see all the other corruption throughout the city, everywhere else, don't tell me that that's it, that program's not going to be abused if it's implemented. It is going to be abused. You're going to have a don't lot of innocent people. Yeah. 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 They'll be able to well, sue well intentioned, but this broad net that they're casting is going to catch a lot of people that shouldn't be caught into it. That's the hundred percent. Everybody sees and, you know, it's just same thing, same thing like the gang uh, database. It'd be the same thing, right? Now you got this gang database where if my brother is in a gang, then they put me in the database. And they put my sister and my mama, anybody, you know, they, they just throw anybody that they know in the gang database. They're affiliated with this gang. And so, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't understand. Lori Lightfoot is really a prosecutor. And I really wish she would have ran for state's attorney and lost. Uh, because this just this just wasn't the job for her. We need a mayor. We need a mayor that understands the needs of businesses, to understand the needs of, of, of citizens, to understand the needs of young people and the youth and what they're going through. Right. We got an 11 year old carjacker out here. Right. And an and 11 year old should not be spending his time carjacking. Why is that? If that's the question that you must ask, that, those that are the questions that you must answer. That's the solution that you have. That's the proactive preventative solution you have to come up with before the reactionary one. So let there me, you know. let's, let's, let's. Because, let because Jerry, that 11 year old carjack is carjacking now, but what happens when he gets 16? Sure. What happens when he gets 18? Now he's a murderer. Go ahead, Jerry. Let's play pretend here for a moment. Uh, let's play pretend that you are in a position of leadership that has the ability to uh, make the kind of proposal that we're not seeing proposals that we're not seeing right now from our current, uh, from our current mayor, w where do we start? W where, w where do you suggest that we start in preventative solutions instead of waiting to pour money into the police budget, put more cops on the streets who don't even appreciate the privilege they have serving the public when you've got clowns like the fraternal order police uh, president yeah. uh, st stirring up the troops and, um, and, and, and coming up with solutions that, are going to help people as opposed to punish them and make things worse. Well, let's let's just go back to what I was just talking about. We just okay. talked about 11 year old carjacker. The detective, the detective, one of the detectives in the division called me and said, Jay Maul, we don't have anybody anywhere to send this kid. Right now. That is one of the problems. One of the problems is we always wait until the problem happens before, you know, and now we react into it like you talked about. We need real solutions for young people, young people in these neighborhoods who, who, who come from a, a, a broken household. Right. Who goes into a school and then these schools are, are dis, I have harsh disciplinary actions and putting them out. I was one of those kids kicked out of nine schools. So we got to really understand how to reach our youth when they are in very young ages. OK. And then even in those 11 year old ages. So when they go into to, to uh, come out of that household, they're going to go. The, the first place they're going to go is that school. Right. And, and the schools must have the support needed so that they can make sure that they're supporting these young people. Clinical staff members, counselors. We talking about uh, after school programs, making sure those kids uh, have somewhere to go all the way until those evening times where those mothers are finally getting off of work. We got to understand that the majority of these households are ran by single mothers. That means that single mothers are working all day. 
So we got to make sure for less than minimum program. wage too. Oh, yeah, while they're, while they're being blamed for the, for no one they're watching their kids. And invariably, yeah. we also see other communities sitting here claiming, "Well, it's the fault of the broken households. It's not everyone else's responsibility." You're laying out what the challenges are that other people are not yeah. really paying attention to and understanding. Paying attention to that. So they're the essential workers. Those are ones that are working doubles, you know, to try to provide. Um, um, for their families. And so what happens with those kids? Those kids either are in the streets, right? And, and they always say, where are the parents? Well, the parents are doing what they think they should be doing, working all day, okay? Because they didn't have no other opportunity. So, uh, um, um, so they go into those schools, they need the proper support, okay? If they don't get the proper support in the schools, guess who gonna see them next? They're gonna, nine times out of 10, CPD. see a police officer, okay? So- why don't we have programs, not only in the schools, right, but a program that is designed right in the police department, uh, deferment programs where young people are not being charged with nonviolent crimes and going down to the state's attorney's office, but being mandated to mentoring programs, a certain mentoring program that we fund millions of dollars throughout throughout these communities where if they get in trouble and meet this, this criteria, They'll be mandated to this program for 12 months so that they will not be charged. A program that focuses on getting them on the right path, focuses on putting them in the trade if they're in the uh, older teenage level. You know, certain programs that the city adopts that we fund, because you got to understand, there are a lot of nonprofits out here that are doing good. But the problem is they're not able to do nothing but for 50 kids because they don't have the funding for it. The city should be adopting Pro certain programs in different areas and funding them. So when they go to the police department, the police department has somewhere to send that 11 year old carjacker. Okay. And that, that program could then go to that house and see what's the problem and say, all right, well, he needs transportation. They need food. They need whatever, et cetera. And they're able to really support that kid all the way through and have somebody there on him saying, making sure he's going to school, making sure he's getting his work done, you know, having a mentor that uh, makes that kid feels like somebody care about him. Because the reality of the fact is when you got a parent who's working all the time, kids, they, they, they have a lack of, 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 um, of feeling like they, that nobody cares for them. And nobody loves them. Right. And because so many people are out working and providing for them, they don't understand that. They, they need to, to feel like somebody's there for them. If they don't, guess who they're going to get it from? Another kid on the street who's going through the same problems, who is feeling unloved. And that person is going to become their brother. And when somebody do something to their brother, they got to retaliate because they feel like I got to retaliate for my brother. And now they have in a click and now committing crimes, carjackings, et cetera. It's so, their extended secondary family is what it becomes. It's their secondary family. Those are the, that's the person I'm gonna see every day. When I go outside on that corner, I know my my friend and my brother is gonna be there. I know when I need something, when I need to get somewhere, he's gonna give me some transportation. So we gotta really understand. Here's the problem, Jerry. The problem is, is we keep electing leaders who really don't understand these neighborhoods. Lori Lightfoot from Massillon, Ohio. Okay. Um, David Brown from Dallas. I mean, everybody in all her, in city halls from out of town, and they're va they're they're very disconnected from what's really going on. But if I can also interrupt, I, the cynical part of me thinks they do understand, Jay Mel. It's just not their priority. I, I hate yeah, to go there, true. but I do think that you're right. They're, they they don't know the our streets as well as people like yourself or people who've lived here all their lives. But there's also a disconnect. It's just not their priority. The passion. The, the passion. The passion. And that's the second thing that I would say is either they, they don't know and they don't know what to do or second, they don't have the passion for it because they haven't lived it and experienced it. So it's not their priority. You know, if, if Lori Lightfoot experienced the things that I've experienced growing up, OK, watching people shot, watching my single mother go to work all day. OK, I, I, I've seen everything that these young people are seeing today. I could have easily went into a different path. Kicked out of nine schools was a troubled kid. I could have easily went into a different path. But if it was not for mentors who grabbed me and said, you have too much potential and I'm going to show you how to channel it. I could be a different kid today. If Lori Lightfoot was one of those kids her passion would be a little bit different and her understanding would be a little bit different and it would be a priority. There's a disconnect there.
Um, yeah. I know that you 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 have been spearheading an effort with the Majesty All Stars. You're trying to get this youth center off the ground. Last I remember following, and I think that this was maybe about I want to say five six months ago. It seemed that there may have been a breakthrough in that before your last altercation uh, down at City Hall, I think a month ago, during another yeah. protest, was that uh, they they seemed receptive to having you come down to talk about, uh, I think, relinquishing that school property. But I never saw, I mean, I assume nothing went through because there was no follow up on it after you said, we've got exciting news, th they want to talk with us, but then I didn't see a follow-up. What ended up happening there? Were they just blowing more smoke up everybody's butts or? Yeah. I mean, I think this, this is not a priority for the mayor. And at the end of the day, we're just working on getting that building and that property from the city. It's been sitting in the city's hands for eight years now. Jesus. We want to, we have, we want to build an 80,000 square foot facility there that can change the neighborhood. Yep. And we're not asking for any city dollars. Creating a preventative solution. You're creating yeah, a preventative a solution. solution. This should be something that the mayor wants to help fund. But we said, listen, so, so we can make this nice and easy. Just sign it over to us or sell it to me. I'll buy it right now. I don't care how much it is. I'll buy it out of my pocket. And I still don't have any plan for them to, to relinquish that building because they have some, you know, underlying feelings about me. But. It's an ego thing. It, it, you almost have to wonder. It's an ego thing because you're it proposing is. a solution they can't come up with, and you know, in their eyes, too, in their eyes help. too. Yeah, well, it gives in their eyes, it gives you more political clout when this isn't about political clout. Hundred percent. It is. You're trying is, to help the youth in your community. It's totally about. It's totally about the youth, and I don't need their help. I got this. If if I get the building tomorrow, the state of Illinois will give me several million. Okay. I don't even have he to go to the city. The state is already committed to helping us with this project, but we don't have the building. So at the end of the day, this is a $15 million project. doesn't cost much. We already have it fu uh, uh, fully funded and we can have this building up within a year. And it'll be a, a facility where young people will be able to go and we'll be able to tackle all the problems that they're going through. We'll have a wellness center and support staff on, on, on staff. We'll have an aviation department and flight, flight simulators where they'll be able to learn how to be pilots and a coding department where they can learn tech and how to build apps. Uh, I mean, when I talk, when we talk about really what's going on with our young people, we'll be able to do it all the way from the beginning, because we'll also have a 24 hour child care center where, you know, we'll be able to to tackle the problems of our from babies on up to, to 2025. So uh, at the end of the day, this is a very revolutionary center and is nothing like it. And we're not asking the city to do nothing but sign a web building that you never even looked at. For the last eight years, it's been sitting abandoned. There ain't no swings on the on a swing set. The park looks abandoned for eight years. You never even came over there. All we asking you to do is sell the property to me, or 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 give it to me. I don't care. They they suddenly paid attention and came over when you were protesting uh, during the hunger strike yeah. out on the roof, where it was like they put, the light they put like four light bulbs in there after I got done. Yeah. <laughs> what was the result of uh, the last altercation where you guys were protesting? And I, I know you were arrested and the judge dropped all the charges. Uh, what, what ended up uh, being the the, uh, the 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 final story with that? Well, they didn't have they didn't have um, much evidence. Obviously, I well, there was no evidence. You were you were legally up. protesting. Yeah, I was but, legally but tell protesting. Her Tell our pro I'm sorry. Tell our viewers what you were protest what you were there with the group yeah. protest. So I mean, this was right after it was a. Uh, um, a day after Simeon had two kids that were killed, two young teenagers were killed, at, at, um, both uh, one right outside of Simeon, one a few miles away. And two. so two of that students, so the, the, the school was just in a wreck and, and from the staff to, to the students. And it made me so mad because I was there. I went to the scene when that first kid was killed. Um, the second kid was was an activist. Um, and all of the parents, everybody reaching out to me, this is my neighborhood, everything's going on. And the mayor, the next day, doesn't even come to the school. There is no type of effort to so, have a bunch of counselors or, or nothing, no type of effort to support these kids who just lost two kids to gun violence the previous day. Everybody's talking about it. And there's no type of support for these young people. And there's no mayor to come and say, hey, 
We're here for you. And we have these people here for you. And so what they did was they sent those kids to school. It got so crazy. Then they sent more threats. And all they did was send those kids home. And so after that, I was just so mad. So many parents wanted to do stuff. Um, I had parents who lost kids with me. We all went down to City Hall while the mayor is sitting in her office, not doing anything. She could have came to Simeon and assured those parents that she was going to do everything that she can, but she didn't. And so we made so much noise and uh, uh, her security guards, um, you know, got in front. And then Lori made the call to her security guards to have me arrested. Wow. Can I just interject here? Even if even if it was just for show. Yeah. How much goodwill she could have gotten had she come out and met with you and, and, and said, let's talk about this. But instead, yeah, again, it, it, it's a threat to her ego. It's a threat to her authority. Call security, get you out of there when everybody can yeah, see yeah. exactly what's going on the mayor and the reasons you were there. Just want the mayor to do the right thing, Jerry. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking, I'm, I'm not asking for, you know, you know, the mayor to go, uh, uh, you know, super above and beyond. I want her to do the oh. right thing. And, and, and you're the mayor. And these people are suffering. Do the right thing by these people. Listen to the people that are in these neighborhoods. Make decisions that are uh, proactive and, and, and make sure that you're showing people that you care. Not every time you get up, you're talking about prosecution. All right. I'm suing. I'm arresting. We need to hold them accountable. More incarceration. More incarceration. Yeah. And you're not talking about the real solutions in the neighborhoods. And, you know, I was talking about just some, some time ago. She came into my neighborhood to a vacant lot and said she wanted to fund projects that people wanted to use in vacant lots. But you're not talking about coming to build homeowners and build up new homes or, you know, make make these neighborhoods look better. You're not talking about investing in the infrastructure so that potholes are not on every corner. Uh, uh, You're not talking about landscaping. I mean, you're not giving no hope to these neighborhoods. You're talking about people who want to use these vacant lots for community gardens. I mean, let's be serious here. These neighborhoods need real intentional investment and real work, and we need to rebuild them. If you want these young people to care about their neighborhood, then give them something to care about. Give them somewhere to go. Give them a neighborhood that's paved with nice trees and hope. So when they walk to school and they're walking around, they feel like there is, uh, they're inspired and, and they feel like there's hope for the future. But we don't do that. These neighborhoods look like ghost towns and third world, con- world countries. And, you know, we, we they go through so many problems and we expect them to sit in a classroom and learn two plus two and not get in trouble and, and go on the streets and be productive citizens. We're expecting too much and not giving none. Yeah. It makes no sense. I, I think that's the best place to leave it. I mean, I think everybody can see what the problem is. And uh, I, I don't I I guess we're just going to have to sit and wait and see what else happens after this press conference. I don't know that she's going to be able to get that that initiative through with suing gang leaders. I mean, I, I we'll just have to see what happens. She's, she's Listen, buying off a lot of the black politicians. So yeah, I, mean, we'll yeah. I want to wish you a very uh, Merry Christmas and a happy holiday to you it's and your well, family. And thank you again. You know, you're always welcome to join us here. If you have anything else that you want to talk about, I'm so very grateful you had time this evening to come on and talk about this. It was a last minute thing, but uh, I felt the best person to come on and share their thoughts about everything was, was you. So Appreciate it so much, Jamal. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Jerry. Happy holidays and have a great New Year. You too. Take care.